Peace and blessings. Welcome back to Black Student Success Week. Greetings and salutations to all those who've been with us all week and those who are joining us for the first time. I am Professor Eric Handy and allow me to introduce my co-moderator for today, Dr. Bull. We invite you to join the conversation on social media platforms using the hashtag Black Student Success Week, hashtag the Black Hour. Send us those pictures. You know the drill, affirmations, critical takeaways, and plans of actions. As, as well, please use the Q&A feature for questions directed to today's panelists. By now, many of you know why we are here. Why every day this week from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m., America's top educators, California politicians, some of the world's most sought out researchers, and the dynamic leadership of California's community college system has come together during hashtag the black hour. They, we, and you have come together to do what? Follow the money. What money, professor? The billions of dollars invested to ensure all California residents have an opportunity to gain the skills and education they need to participate in and advance the state's workforce and economy, except Higher education and investment does not fall equitably across racial ethnic groups. In fact, when you follow the money, black students are systemically underinvested in by the state when it comes to higher education funding, perpetuating economic in in inequity for black Californians and the maintenance of a permanent underclass. To recap, Black Student Success Week, Monday, we kicked off with the conversation regarding the importance of being unapologetically supportive of Black students and Black student success. Tuesday, we heard from African-American students who shared stories about the benefits and challenges associated with their transfer pathway and degree completion at the California Community Colleges. Wednesday, Black leaders and CEOs in higher education discuss actions that may lead to an increase in the number of Black, Indigenous, and people of color serving as college and university presidents. Thursday, yesterday, California legislators identified key bills and legislation that advocates support on behalf of Black student success. Today, for our grand finale, this webinar will cover the role of Black tax in serving on committees to diversify the faculty ranks in the trials and tribulations Black faculty endure to ensure adequate representation in the academy. To begin this important dialogue, we start with the voice of the faculty of the community colleges in matters of statewide concern. It is the Academic Senate for California community colleges who make recommendations on statewide matters affecting all community colleges. With us today is Dolores Davison. Dolores Davison currently serves as the president of the Academic Senate for the California Community Colleges. She previously served as North Representative, Area B Representative, Secretary, and Vice President prior to being elected as the president in April of 2020. She also served on numerous ASCCC statewide committees prior to being elected to the Executive Committee in 2010. Ms. Davison is also a professor and former department chair in the Department of History and Women's Studies at Foothill College in Los Altos Hills, California. She served as the Foothill College Academic Senate President for six and a half years, as well as serving as the District Academic Senate President for Foothill, De Anza, and as curriculum chair. She received her bachelor's degree from the University of California, Davis in history with minors in political science and Russian, her master's in history from the University of Oregon, and is ABD from the University of Illinois, Chicago. With no further ado, President Davison, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Professor Hardy. And it's always a little disconcerting to hear my resume read out loud or my introduction because 
it seems so far away since governance has been such a focus for the last couple of years. I'm looking forward to uh, eventually making my way back into the classroom, which I hopefully will be doing after next year's um, term as president. Uh, so I wanna thank you very much, uh, Professor Hardy and Dr. Bull and everyone involved with Black Student Success Week for including the Academic Senate as your partners, uh, having us be part of all of the different dialogues that have been happening as well as the planning. I wanna give a special thank you to Myra Cruz who has been our representative for Black Student Success Week. Uh, she is not able to be here this uh, afternoon because she is the chair of our Career Technical Education Leadership Committee and she is kicking off the Career Non-Credit Institute uh, as we speak. Um, I'm really grateful for this topic and I'm looking forward to the discussion that's going to be had because the issue of faculty involvement in committee service and both local governance and state governance is one very close to my heart. Um, we understand that diversification does not happen through attrition. Uh, diversification in the faculty ranks is not going to happen simply because people retire. This needs to be an active, engaged conversation and action on the part of all faculty at our colleges uh, to ensure that we are getting the most diverse pools and the most diverse candidates possible. And one of the ways toward doing that is to have local governance represented by diverse faculty within the ranks at the local colleges. Um, we have struggled with this in the past. Um, certainly the executive committee for the California Community Colleges has struggled with this, both in terms of uh, ethnic and racial representation, as well as gender representation. Um, this last year, for the first time, the executive committee officers were made up entirely of women. Uh, that has not happened in the 51 year history, 52 year now, history of the Academic Senate. Uh, we also had 60% of our elected representatives and our executive director be BIPOC faculty and representatives. Um, this was a deliberate and very um, intentional approach to bring diverse faculty voices to the table, to ensure that the diverse faculty in our system are heard, and to enable us to continue to expand the number of diverse faculty within our system. Um, we need faculty of color. We need women faculty. We need faculty who bring different voices to the table in local governance. And while it does take time and it is a commitment, it is one of the most important ones that you can make. Uh, I know that the various panelists are going to speak about the reasons for this, the importance of it, the challenges of it. Uh, those all exist. I do not ignore that there are challenges to serving in local governance, um, but I really hope that after today's uh, presentation and session, um, and I am delighted that Pam Haynes is closing us out because no one can speak of service uh, at any level more articulately and more articulately than uh, Board President Haynes. Um, and so I'm looking forward to the conversation. I won't be able to join you for all of it, but I know that this will be an engaged and important dialogue, and I hope to see many of you uh, faculty members potentially running for executive committee positions, uh, either at your local campus or even with the statewide committee. And so I thank you very much for the introduction, and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Boole. Thank you so much, President Davison. We appreciate your commitment to seeing diversity in the faculty ranks. Thank you for your service. But now it is time to hear from faculty in the California Community College System. Here to set up this awesome panelist of great scholars that we have today is my friend, my brother, Dr. Bull. Hey, Professor E. Handy, thank you so much. And thank you for the phenomenal work you and Katrina have been doing this whole week. If we can introduce our slide deck, we've got a wonderful from SoCal to NorCal collaboration of faculty from various disciplines. Leading us off is Dr. Nairi Berry. She's a faculty member. She's also the Director of Race and Equity and Social Justice Center down at the LA Community College District. We also have my sister as well, Dr. Rachel Hastings, she's a professor of communication at Maricosta College, also known as DOC. She's also the director of the North County Higher Education Alliance. Now, we up north, we got Dr. Kyle White, he's a faculty member at San Jose City College. He's also co-coordinated the PTP program, which we'll talk about in a bit. 
My Two Soul Sisters, Professor Ebony Tyree from San Diego City College, English professor representing the Bufu College going to San Diego City College. We also have Dr. Aaron Charlins, Emoja coordinator, Miss Emoja, uh, former Emoja student, then became an Emoja coordinator, professor of counseling also at San Diego City College. Next slide. We have from the IE, Dr. You've probably seen her all over these webinars. She's the area D representative for the Equity, Diversity, and Action Committee that Dolores talked about. She, she chairs that committee for the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges. Very, very strong and proper voice there. Dr. Sam Foster, bubbly personality. You've seen him quite a bit as well. He's the South representative and he's also the act for the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges. We have Dr. Jessica Ayo Alabi. She's a chair professor of the Department of Sociology, Gender, Ethnic Studies, and Social Justice Studies from Orange Coast College. And to bring us all to our Zen space, we have Salam Gilbertistos. She's the next step coordinator working with the foster, former foster youth students, and is a counselor and a colleague of mine at San Diego City College. So we've got a huge, diverse pool of Black men and women from the North and the South, from various disciplines to talk about the cost of freedom. We saw Dr. Cornell West, one of the most greatest, brilliant minds this year, denied tenure within the academy. And so to have black minds and to speak that Black Lives Matter is inextricably connected to the injustices that we witness in our system. So with that being said, I wanna invite all my colleagues to come off video mute. And I'm gonna throw this question to you, Dr. Parker. Why is it necessary to have a race conscious approach in hiring black faculty specifically? And what has it meant for you in your own professional career? We're going to say the biggest thing that we've been saying on, on Zoom. You on mute. The biggest okay. <laughs> right? Right? So thank, thank you for the platform. Great question in terms of the justification of hiring Black faculty and the understanding the diversity it brings in terms of race, race consciousness. First and foremost, for diversity purposes, but also more importantly for racial imbalances. So when we talk about systemic practices in California community colleges, we want to begin to think about how are we going to not only remedy past practices, but to move to a desired outcome as it pertains to the elimination of the, what we call barriers or opportunities that we're gonna now begin to call them as we create programs specifically for African-American and Black students with the creation of hiring practices and intentional strategies around race consciousness and the hiring of Black faculty so that we are creating curriculum design with the African and Black student in mind. I know we have a lot of panelists today and I, I know each of us can go on and on around the topic, but achieving our goal of diversity. We can't have that conversation. We can't begin to create policies without being raci racially conscious. Thank you for the question. Can I jump in here? Uh, thank you, LaTanya. I'm, I'm just gonna jump in, I'll be quick. Um, for those of us who don't have multicultural centers, we, we do, we just kind of got functional, but I think all of us know what it is like to have our offices be the black student kind of place to hang out. That's one reason we need to target um, and hire black faculty because we know we are a resource for black faculty, which I think you called the black tax. And I certainly lecture a lot about the black tax. Um, the other reason is many of us for years and um, our mentors and their mentors have fled white supremacy and joined black organizations. And we've joined those organizations to have a safe haven. So if you don't target black faculty to try to hire them, and when I say target, I mean do the footwork to go out of your way to find them, you're not gonna be able to hire them because you need to do intrusive invitations. 
That means that we are not part of ASA. I'm a sociologist, PSA necessarily. I've been a part of the Association of Black Sociologists for 20 years. And it's the only place I go because it feels like a family reunion. And when I go to ASA, I feel invisible. So I tell my human resources, why aren't you going to ASA and Black associations to try to hire people? You can't just fly this in higher education and think you're gonna get diverse faculty. Why? Because we fled, we need safe havens. We need colleagues that support us. And so you need to go to those places and be intrusive and do the footwork so you can find us. Thank you. Having a reaction to this question earlier and then it subsided. And I'll tell you about my reaction in a minute, but. If we aren't intentional about this, uh, we will keep producing what we've been producing. And that's a white supremacist racist system. If we aren't intentional, we will continue to have the Karens. And I don't use that term to be funny. I use it because it very much captures, uh, there's an image we get, we understand what Karen means at this, at this state. We have the Karens of our institutions who are changing scores um, to, to ensure that certain people aren't moving through the process because at my institution, my administration, we black, administration is black at my institution. And so people are literally changing scores to make sure that people don't make it through that system. The reaction that I had to this question and I'm feeling it in my body, Professor Tyree's laughing at me right now, um, is that you know schools really act like, you know, this is an option right, that our contributions, um, that our value, the fact that we're having these conversations that we're optional, right? This is, we're not the side piece, right? We're not, you know, having dinner and then we're gonna go sneak out and get a couple of cookies or, or an extra slice of pie. This is the main course, this is nourishment. So the fact that, you know, people will come occasionally and say, you know, I think it's time we, we hire a black person. We, we don't have a black person. This should always be part of the conversation. We are the main course. Our value is undeniable and we will continue to be, um, you know, we, we whisper, we whisper. I caught myself whispering to a colleague on a, on a, on a hiring committee about, you know, we need, we need black males. We were whispering outside of the committee meeting, right? No more whispering. That's the charge. No more whispering. White supremacy doesn't whisper. We will not change the system with a whisper, right? Stop whispering. Be outright. Shout it out. We need Black faculty. So the charge is no more whispering. Even after 2020 and 2021, when we are, when we are, uh, we are not comfortable right now. People are not comfortable. When, when they get back into 2022 and they're comfortable and the image of George Floyd is no longer in their brain, shout. No more whispering. I, I like to take up with that. And, and um, when I'm listening to everyone, I'm feeling triggered, right? I'm feeling triggered because this notion that we need to be diverse or we need to be racial equity and people of color. Um, I love all my black, my brown brothers and sisters, but this space is for African-American. And I want us to take that language out of diversity. I think that word diverse keeps people comfortable. And then when we assert and we get our hiring committees together, we say, oh, we have five women of color in the applicant pool. We have four men of color in the applicant pool. And then by, by intentionally, the African-Americans are not right, are not made the finalists. So let's pay attention to what's doing. We don't need any more conversations. We need actions. I'm coming from the largest community college district in the nation, LACCD. And we have about 250,000 um, students. We are a Hispanically serving institution. But when I say we are lacking in the hiring, mm -hmm. permanent tenure, and administration of African American people, it's absurd. So it's no way that we in Southern California and some of our most marginalized communities that we cannot hire African American students. So what do we need to do? We need to be unapologetic, just as others are, just as others when they are in those, um, on those hiring committees, they go around the table and say, I'm voting for this person. We need to be unapologetically take out the biasness of what we have against our black brothers and sisters personally and move forward and say, can this sister or brother get the job done? That's what we need to do. 
Wow, we are having porch talk, as they say in Emoja right now. This is amongst family. And, and when you get family in the room and you start talking about things that are personal to the family, they take it personal and the energies get high. And so I want to just encourage the family, keep the energies high because we need this. We need this decompression. We need to be able to have these critical conversations that are a little tough. I want to allow uh, Dr. White to get in here first, but I want to move the needle on the conversation and play, as they say, devil's advocate to what we just heard. Many um, hiring committees will say, well, how can Black faculty and staff provide the, what we call the hidden curriculum and give examples of incorporating diversity to all students and not just students of color. So I wanna ask you, starting with Dr. Wright and all the panelists, in what ways you bring your whole blackness to the classroom and lessons and encounters with students and colleagues and how is that great for the institution? How is that beneficial for all students, not just black or brown students? Thank you for that question, uh, Brother Handy. Thank you, panelists, and thank you, uh, Dr. Barry, for, for pointing what you just pointed out. Um, for myself, you know, we, we all know um, that having a black teacher is really a, 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 a measure of success for all students. Black teachers and black faculty really affect positively all students, and then especially you know, since we're in such short demand or such short supply, I should say, in the uh, state of California in particular, a black male teacher, um, you know, adds a certain, uh, another level of, um, you know, just a, just another touch to and another flavor and spice to this, this gumbo that we call, you know, uh, public education. So um, back to the, the point and back to your question, I think that for most students, particularly in, in my classes that I teach, and I teach African-American studies so I can really be unapologetically black and be my black self and bring that to the table. Um, I am the first black teacher that tons of students have. So I don't take that responsibility lightly. I don't take that privilege lightly. And so with that being said, um, I wanna ensure that students of all races, all colors, and especially black students can also see this level of role modeling, this level of, um, black excellence, this level of you know success, and this level of really depositing positive um, life into them, you know, from a black teacher, from a black male educator, um, and also I know that every time I step on the campus, I am really fighting the statistics and being anti-statistic and the counter narrative to you know what's been said about black men and black teachers and and all that you know all, all the negative things that we get so. I'm trying to stay composed because this is so much um, I want to say about it, so much really, you know, uh, uh, passion about that. And I'm, I'm serious about what I do in the classroom and on the campus. And um, I'm serious about Black student success. I'm serious about all student success, but especially Black student success because, you know, I was those Black students, um, in a, you know, in a, in a previous life. Um, so I would say that, again, Black educators bring so much to the table that is unwritten, that is unseen. We carry so much, uh, even after class is over and after the, you know, you go home and that type of thing. We carry so much because, you know, there's a lot of responsibility and there's a lot of um, there's just a lot of unseen, unextra, as, as was mentioned, this black text that goes along with our profession. So it is a labor of love. It has to be. Mm. It definitely has to be. It definitely has to be. You know, Dr. White, I appreciate how you said you teach within Black studies so that you can be that unapologetically, you know, Black perspective. I teach in communication. And I think the first thing that we need to recognize is we have to love ourselves as ourselves in our classrooms, right? Like, I don't just teach Black students and I don't just teach Black perspectives or methods, but I always speak Blackness anytime I move or operate in the classroom. Yes. And that level of hyper 
hyper visibility is that hidden curriculum that really falls on our shoulders, especially when you teach students who don't look like you. I've had the privilege of teaching across a number of different campuses from HBCUs to down at Southwestern College, where it is a majority of you know, Latinx students, and to now at Miracosta, where it's pretty diverse, but I have a lot more white students. And it's so visible who I am in the classroom that the first thing I have to tell my students is come as you are. Like, come as you are. Don't abandon your language. Don't abandon your that hood that you have in you. Don't get rid of your accent. Come as you are and learn to love that part of you because you cannot speak and operate from your power unless you love all of who you are. Right. And that type of empowerment is so important, especially in the age where communication, which is typically recognized as a soft skill, is one of the most essential skills that you need to have moving forward in the workforce. Yeah. Um, Can I add to that? Uh, OK, go ahead. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I just I'll, wanna, I'll, I'll you'll, you. you'll follow me. I just want to say really quick, you know, um, Professor Eric Candy, you asked that question about all students. And uh, Dr. Charlins knows we, you know, we, how can we get this to all students? I guess I, I want to throw a question back out and, and ask folks: Are you okay if it's not for all? Yeah. Okay. When you at when when we talk about equity, um, some something some folks will get left out of that work. Are we okay if it's designed and it's not designed, or it's if it doesn't look like for success for for all? Um, to some degree. That, that's my thing because I understand that sometimes the work that we do because a lot of times we don't know what equity looks like. We've never mm -hmm. seen it before or whatever these words are. Like Dr. Barry, I don't know what to call it, um, but we've, we don't know what it looks or feels like because it's, it's never been. Uh, and so are you okay with being a little uncomfortable that something is designed and it's designed specifically for our black students? Mm -hmm. um, with no one else in mind, but black students. Uh, I'm okay with that. Absolutely. I, you know, I'm okay with that. And so we, we have to also ask our colleagues, are you okay with having a conversation around success for our black students that is not in consideration of all? Um, right. I do believe essentially all will all benefit. Look at the, look at the greatness that comes out of black. You, you will, you know, but in the moment it may not look or feel that way. You folks need to begin to get comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Not to apologize. Is, is that what I heard? Not to apologize to black students. Hey, <laughs> no, no apologies. Right? No apologies. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, um, and and I and I I and I'm I strongly believe that there is no way that we can target black students without benefiting the entire institution and the entire country because black students make up an important part. Of the institution and, and, and of the state and of the country as a whole. And so inherently, the, the institution will be better if we can help Black students. But I also want to mention um, it's also really important as we affect the change in how the system works, is that these students, these majority students, these white students, see as an authority figure and a knowledgeable figure a person of color that now I'm in the classroom. And so now these ideas about what black people are like and what they're not like can be dissolved as you see that I am the one with a PhD in chemistry teaching you chemistry topics. I am the expert here. And so your idea that black people are inferior can begin to melt away. It's, so it's, it's your ideas about working with black people and the working, with, uh, working with people in the community in a productive way change because of your exposure to black faculty members. So even if you are, so especially if you're not black, it's really important that you have black faculty members because that begins to change the mindset of the country that we can be really be able to affect the entire country at a global level as people begin to recognize that those assumptions about black people are completely false. Yeah. I want, I want to bring in um, Salam with this point that you mentioned um, to your point. Um, also, Salam, you work with a population of foster youth that many people do not really engage in. And, and, and Dr. White mentioned the, the hidden culture. We play uncle and aunt and, and, and mentor and big brother. We're filling voids in our community as about the block tax and the benefit of changing those minds and the value that we do bring to the institutions. Right. 
Yeah, and, and you know what, that's a really good point because if you look at the community college system and who is working with foster care, uh, former foster youth, it is black women, right? That's something I'm paying attention to. And why is that? Because we have that empathy and nurturing piece of us, right? So that piece that all students will benefit from a black faculty or counselor is because we carry that with us with all our students, right? Um, Bull and I teach at San Diego State in a program together. I brought Bull on because, not because I wanted to, and I know him, he's a black person because I know his work, right? And so sometimes we're just not bringing black people on, we're bringing quality black people. And I, so what him and I have been able to do as two black faculty members, when there was only one before for two, three years, has been able to create a space for nurture and our student. And it was really interesting because when we would talk, we would realize we were kind of doing the same work without having a discussion to say, what are you doing? I met with each individual students and we have 90 students in our class, okay? He did too. No other faculty member, they would say the time, I'm not being paid for it. I'm not, you know, it's my time. I'm not gonna spend this. It's like, I can't whatever, right? But we both didn't take that approach. And so our experience with our students, it's not just, it's going to go beyond that classroom because we're training future counselors. So we have input and we're mirroring. So that's what we do. We do always represent, but it's a, it's a, a way that it's a good representative of who we are, all of us in this space, right? And so I wanted to touch on what Aaron said earlier about being an option. It's like an option. I think we also think of ourselves like as a replacement. We are replacing our white counter, you know, before us. No, we need to be a creation. It's not about when people retire. No, it's creating jobs yeah. to support Black students as Black faculty. Others want to respond to that question posed by Dr. Bull? Okay. With, with working on that, that, that theorem that we need to create these opportunities. Like, Dr. We, Handy, can I yes. say something? Really? Oh, yes, yes. I, I said it in the chat, but I, I just want to note too, you know, the conversation we were having before, you know, sometimes we can't get to the work we need to get to because we're so busy trying to justify Absolutely. That the work is worthy, you know. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I can't even, you know, get to the next level to help my students because I'm too busy trying to show you how valuable it, I am right. or how valuable this is. Leave me alone. Let me. I, I don't have to do that by design, like Dr. Foster was saying. I first we need folks to know that, then the work can happen. Then you can let me go. <laughs> Right. Then I don't have to spend time justifying to you how valuable the work is. So, so I, think, so I want to think, tap into that. Yeah, go ahead. I was and I was answering Jacqueline Sims' question about racial battle fatigue, and I'm I'm just going to tell you the truth about my college. I gave up on, and I I was saying this. I gave up on the petty committees and councils. Once I realized that they were transactional, Absolutely. checking the box, See? and I mean, I've been there 17 years and I just realized that they were about checking the box and tokenism and they were not transformational. I decided to focus on transforming students' lives. Absolutely. So for me, I don't get fatigued when I focus on students. It's very rewarding. So um, when they, this year, the pandemic and all the racial stuff, they started creating committees and diverse. I was like, and everybody was for sure I was going to apply to be the coordinator of the multicultural committee and be on the president. And I didn't, I didn't want to be on none of it because mm. you're not getting any more black tax from me. But any student, any black student that needs me, I'm there. And the, and the black faculty caucus, where we talk like this every month, Oh, I'm there because it's so rewarding to see black people and have a family reunion. It's revitalizing right now. I'm, I'm feeling fantastic seeing all these black faces, but no, I'm not, I'm not that for me, that is, that is what we have to do is focus on black students. And if you're at a college where you know that there are people who will hold these positions indefinitely, they're entrenched. Then, then you have to restructure what you're doing, especially if you're already tenured. 
Okay. Doc, Doc. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Dr. Berry. Okay, I, I, was, okay. I, wanted to, I wanted to push back on that a little bit to, to broaden yeah. the conversation. But go ahead, Dr. Berry. And I also see Dr. Tar uh, Charles wants to chime in there too, I believe. So go ahead. Yeah. You, you know, I want us to push back from the way the system is designed and the committees and things like that. We're just following the trend of what happened post pandemic, right? And so if we continue to sign up for these committees with the, with the same sh shared governance, with the same people leading these, these um, committees, knowing that oftentimes they're not about the students, like you said, Dr. Jessica, I think we need to just dismantle the entire system unapologetically going in there black saying, where is the representation for African-American? Where is the money? We talk about equity. We've been talking about equity for since 2014, a little before, right? And each time we bring up that word equity, we see that, oh, they're going to find another marginalized group and African-Americans, particularly African-American males are going back to the bottom of the, um, Barrel. That's that's not okay. In 2021 and to the future, we need to walk into these these committees, on these committees, even in senior leadership um, um, meetings, and let them know. I need to know what you're doing, action step, plan by plan, strategic plans for African-American students. Yeah, we can go on. We're going to lose some friends. We're going to even lose some of our black brothers and sisters because yeah. they don't like that we're not following the status quo. But why are we going to follow? continue to follow status quo and in our face, they are disrespecting African-American students? No, it's time for action. Yeah. All right, Dr. Berry, yes. I want to push back on you a little bit and play uh, the advocate here, okay? Uh, Let's say you're a faculty member watching, you just got tenure, and you're on a campus that doesn't have this, the Black support. You're on a campus that doesn't have a dean that's of color that supports you, a president of color that supports you, an academic chair that's of color that supports you. What do you do? What strategies have the panelists done to survive the Black tax, to dismantle the Black tax, right, dismantle the oppression that you endure, because it can't be all the time. I'm hearing the voice of those watching. I just serve my students. I just serve my students. Oh, let me go in and raise hell in this, in this uh, department meeting. Let me go call out the institutional bias and racisms, because when I do, I won't have a job. I get pushed out. I lose a check. So what strategies can we give those who are watching who, A, don't have the black faculty support, even if there's black faculty on their campus, their jobs is like, no, I'm not getting involved. I don't want to serve Emoja. I don't want to come to any of the black employee gatherings. I don't want to sit with the black folks and gather no meeting. I don't want to go hang out with you afterwards to go drink some coffee and tea and talk about how do we get past the black plight. Oh, better yet, I don't have any administrative of color on my campus to go sit in the office and spill this trauma that I'm experiencing. And yes, for 15 years, five years, 10 years, I've been unapologetically giving all to my black students with my curriculum, but I want more, I need more. What do you say to those individuals? Professor Handy, I'm, I'm, thank you for that question. As I stated before, I work for the largest community college in the district, LACCD, and black representation and leadership faculty tenure is very rare. It's minimum, right? So when you ask that question, I experience that all the time. We as black African Americans, we need to stand by one another. We need to, if we're at, if you're at a campus where you're the only black person and you're afraid of your tenure or you're going through tenure, what are you willing to sacrifice? Right. Is your is your tenure more important or do you feel your tenure is more important than your gift and your talent? Is your tenure more important than what you plan to do, your students and all that? No, no. You know, we hear we what is the point of getting tenure if you can't disrupt the system Right. to be comfortable? And those that don't have tenure, what is the point of being black, African-American, a scholar, if you can't disrupt the system for the people behind you? What are you doing? Why are you an educator? So can I chime in here? Let me just say, my tenure was more important than all that. I sold my soul in white graduate school. So let me say, the orange and Orange Coast College students for Orange County, one of those red dots in blue California. I sold my soul at UC Irvine because I couldn't really be Black, but I wanted a PhD. And for 15 years, I went to every happy hour and smiled. I went to every meeting and smiled. I did what I had to do to get tenure. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. So I tell that person, I didn't have a single confidant and still don't, not one. 
at my college. And I'm telling them that you may have a sad, sad life like I do in Orange County, the home of Disneyland, <laughs> where everybody here supports Donald Trump, okay? So I, I don't have like a great story for that person, but where I am consoled is places like this. And so you might have to wait 17 years like me before you start acting up. I'm just saying it. Because what if I can't wait 17 years? Well, I'm I can't, hearing Dr. I can't. Barry, Dr. Barry saying. I'm just telling you my answer sir, <laughs> because I have reached every career goal I've ever wanted in my whole life now. So I'm acting up and they can't do nothing to me. Come on. Can I chime in on that? Can I chime in? Yeah, yeah, we got, let's go, let's go Dr. Uh, Park. Dr. Dr. Park, White. you're trying to get in here, then we, we'll continue. Yeah, Dr. White was before me, so I'll go after Dr. White. All right, thank you, Dr. Latanya, and good to see you too. Um, so, uh, Professor Handy, that question that you that you raise, and and just like um, Dr. Ayo just mentioned, I'm in the same boat, you know, um, where I put in over ten years of of hard, you know, work, um, only to kind of not get the support that I feel I need from administration on down. And hey, you know, that's sometimes the um, that's sometimes the 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 results of you being yourself and being your unapologetic self. Now, not a whole lot of um, allyship or support on the campus. So similar to what Dr. Alavi just mentioned, you have to find it off campus or in circles where you can get it. But that also, in my opinion, goes back to this idea of the black tax and the need for self-care. Because we know that the corporate model, which colleges are really built on and higher ed is built on this corporate model, it's not for us, it can't sustain us, it doesn't work for us holistically, emotionally, any of that. So I would say to anybody listening, you really have to also think of what else um, and, and also uh, get yourself involved in what else feeds you and fuels you and pushes you. If it's working with students, great. You, are, you may have to do that on campus and outside of campus. If it's uh, knitting and crocheting, great. You know, if it's, uh, if it's working, you know, coaching football or some of this on the side, you have to also pour into the things that make you feel uh, whole and, and sane and be able to balance that so you can go and fight these oppressive um, uh, 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 circumstances that you're dealing on your campus or with your administration or with your other black colleagues and things of that sort or other colleagues just in general. So similar to you, I don't go to any of those things. I walked away from Umoja, you know, for lack of support, um, I walked away from a number of different things that, I, that on the surface, you know, I thought were feeding me, but at the same time, they were, they were taken away from me. And, you know, um, you have to find other ways that fuel you, that feeds you. And so spaces like these, P2P, working with your know, Moja statewide org, maybe not my initial program, exact program, those type of things still feed the need for, um, or the, the internal sense of self. So we still got to work on self, even though we are in these corporate model oppressive places, even when you have people of color, you know, in administration or whatever the case may be. Um, that doesn't always mean that you're going to get the support that you need as a black faculty member. Nine times out of 10, you won't just because of who you are. Understand that, knowing that, know, know that going into the battle. Dr. Parker. Oh my goodness. I think we were reading each other's minds, but we went from this space and understanding that as African-American and black faculty, we always have a sense of community. Yet as African-American family, we have also an understanding that as faculty, we are not retained, we are not promoted and we are not tenured at the same rate of our peer faculty members. So going into that understanding and, and definitely have an understanding of what Dr. White talked about, the question that you posed is me. I am that person, I've lived it. I've been in higher education for 25 years in higher education with the majority in the community college system. And so in navigating those spaces and to answer your question, without the support, without mentorship, uh, it has been, it is tiring. So someone spoke about not getting tired and I'm counseling faculty. So I am in it for the holistic development of students, but you do have to, have an understanding of the space that you're in. And in navigating that space, you have to be willing to go out of your comfort zone 
You have to be the willing to be the target of ridicule. You have to understand that you are not going to have friends in this space. And you are going to have to have that support in other communities if it is not within your local community. And you do have to find yourself, much like I did, without even support with many around me in the academic senate. So I've served on the academic committee locally as the senate president, vice president, and many roles and many committees as the chair without any support. So that meant when I went home, I had a lot of evening talks of support because you're gonna cry, you're gonna get frustrated, but you have to remember what you're there for and what you stand for and what you truly want as an end goal as it pertains to it. For me, my heart is with the African-American male student as a parent raising four males. And I understand not only what they are impacted outside of the community college, but within the community. So someone has to stand and it might as well be me and it might as well be you with, with coming into it with this understanding so that you don't give out and you don't give in to the systemic practices if you want to bring about changes. It can't always, what I've learned over the years, it can't always be about speaking. It has to be understanding about policies, procedures, and practices yeah. to bring about the necessary change. And that will require more listening to speaking sometimes, understanding legislation, mm -hmm and being at the table when legislation is being impacted. Thank you for your time. If I can really, before, we're, gonna, we're gonna switch it up here, but the title is appropriate title, The Cost of Freedom, right? And, and, and the faculty here are talking about the cost, the total, right? And, and Dr. Sean Harper coined this term that I use in my dissertation called owning them. And that is a psycho-emotional burden of having to strategically navigate a racially politicized space occupied by a few of your peers, few role models, few guardians um, from your own racial ethnic. So what people are experiencing here is loneliness. Um, and there's an impact behind that. And so what I wanna offer to those listening in the audience, administrators and other folks, is cluster hiring, coming in with a squad, yes. coming in with a crew of people. Yes. Like we said earlier, you know, talking about benchmarks, like you can hire eight white faculty in a row and there's no, <laughs> No one says anything. <laughs> it's, it's a riot, a pending riot. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> and yes. so I'm going to go uh, Red Robin real quick as we close out and say, hey, tangible takeaway for the audience. 15, 20 seconds. So we'll go with you, Professor Tyree, and then we'll, we'll go clock, uh, counterclockwise here. Tangible takeaway. What would you like the audience to walk away with today? Oh, I, I guess I just for a moment, I address it in the chat. I want to speak to our students, our black students. You all aren't the reason for the tax, for the for the for the exhaustion. Actually, y'all are the reason I keep doing it. Right. Because I, I could probably go do something else. <laughs> but it's it's the students uh, that, that keep me motivated when I when I pop into my classroom and I see, you know, my students eager to learn, eager to to get information that I can support them in ways that is what yeah. keeps me doing doing the work. So I, I want students to know, keep coming, keep showing up, keep asking questions, rely on the black faculty that you know, you, you trust and that love you because we love doing what we do despite the shenanigans uh, that we deal with on a regular basis. So I just wanna um, encourage and motivate the students that are listening today that it's these spaces you see on this panel, we don't get, we never get tired of serving y'all, you know. We, we get tired of the system that puts in barriers for us to do what we need to do for you. Uh, so we see you and, and we love you. We are the reason why we do, you all are the reason why we do what we do. Thank you so much. Salam. Yeah, just to piggyback on that. Yes, we are here for you. But I also want to let people know this is designed for what it's doing. And it is to prevent wealth, not just our wealth, right, in our present, but generational wealth, right? This idea of tenure to keep secure in our jobs. So know that and know that we have been able to navigate it and we do whatever we can because we're survivors, you know, we know where we come from. The other part is don't, you know, doubt yourself and apply to whatever position you're thinking because others don't have that doubt. And so learn even from that process and be sure to reach out to others that are just, you know, in the same position as you. And I'm talking to classified and adjunct 
out there because the struggle is real when you're trying to move from an adjunct to a full-time contract. But reach out to us because we've been there. We know the process. So apply and uh, don't doubt yourself. Absolutely. We just saw a president didn't need the minimum qualifications and got that for four years. So apply for all the jobs you can get. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Charles. Piggybacking, I, I wrote some real quick notes, piggybacking on what was just said. Um, we need a new structure and new system that enables us to serve the students in the way that we need to serve them. There is no job description that qualifies, there's no pay scale that quantifies the kind of work that we are doing with our students. Um, when we enter into these institutions, we are immediately in community with our Black students and we are all the things. We are talking to them about addiction. They are calling us when the police are harassing them, literally. You can hear them screaming. They are um, at, we're writing, helping them write letters to get their father out of prison. We are all of those things to our students. Um, and so I want to just echo what, what Ebony said. It, it is not all day, every day. I will serve the students. That's where my heart wants to be. What makes me tired is, is having to prove my value. What makes me tired is the person saying, can you give those 30 minutes back to the department? What are you, what are you talking about? Give those 30 minutes back to the department. We, we're working 24 seven, taking text messages at 11 o'clock at night because my student is addicted to Percocet and he, he needs somebody to talk to so he doesn't relapse. I'm gonna be that person for you. I'll just share this real quick. One of my students FaceTimed me the other day. Actually, we had three students get admitted on Wednesday to UCLA. One of my students who FaceTimed me, um, I looked up how many times I served that student in my, in my personal Outlook calendar. It was 24 contacts, 24 contacts with a student for that kind of success. What does the institution show when I go in SARS? Seven. There's no way to quantify the, the work that we're doing with students, it, it exists in the margins, but all of the et cetera, that is our job. All of the stuff that is considered et cetera, that is the essential part of our job. Last thing, I'm gonna squeeze this in, sorry, Bull. Right, to the administrators right. listening, when we ask to go to, the, the, when we ask to go to Africa, and when we ask to go to, to leave the, the state, and when we ask to go to that same conference over and over and over, year after year after year, and you're looking around like, but other people need to get to have a chance to go. Don't take that conference from me. That's where I get fed. The spiritual gifts that I have that I give to my students, the soulfulness that I bring to my space, I need to, to, to get re-nourished. And I'm going to tell you the places that are going to re-nourish me and refill me. And I need you to have my back and allow me to, to go to Africa and allow me to go to Amen every single year. Find more money for the other people who haven't gone. That's right. Go ahead now, Dr. Alavi. Um, I'm going to use my time to explain exactly what the black tax is because not only have I don't want students to be offended, I don't want faculty and staff to fear talking about it. Um, right now, the black hour is a black tax. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a work of love. We're here because we love oh, Black Hold on, hold on, Doc, Doc, I don't mean to cut you off, sister. No, 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 we can't let that pass. Say I'm that sorry. Again. No, say that again. Say that okay. again. Okay, so, so the Black Hour is a Black tax. This is, this is a work of love, mm. okay? We are here because we love Black people. We love Black students. So please don't ever get that twisted. This is about love for our people. So what black taxes is an, an indictment, okay, of the system, the administration and white supremacy, okay? So it's never about the student. It's that people manipulate the love we have for our people, right? Mm -hmm. And that our colleagues don't care and get to go home and get to, not plan Black History Month and get to not plan Kwanzaa and get to not care about you. And because they know we love you, okay? <laughs> they exploit that. I need everybody to really understand that. So I'm not grieving the Black tax because I love Black students and Black people, Black faculty and staff. I, I grieve the Black tax because it's pimping. It's pimping, okay? And I need everybody to understand that that all my colleagues right now are at lunch, okay? They, they doing whatever they wanna do. 
but I'm right here because I want to be. I'm right here because I got to be. I'm right here because all these people was going to be here and I knew they would be. And we need to be. And we always going to be here. And they know that. And they're not going to pay us. That's exploitation. I, I'm good, but I just need y'all to know that. I saw so many people asking about it. Some people feeling bad about it. Don't you dare. We do this because we, we want to. And they know it. Thank you. And thank everybody for coming. Absolutely. Doc. Man, sis, first of all, I just want to say I really appreciate the privilege of being in this collection of Black excellence today. Um, this is the reason why we need to have cluster hiring, because you not only get that representation that really matters, but you get the Black theory, you get the Black philosophy, you get the Black thought, you get our Black walk, you get all of that together in a way that is um, it, it reflects a sense of solidarity. And for me, that's the reason why we always have to focus on a race conscious, hiring, inclusive effort. First of all, we should never be without race consciousness. We operate in a race conscious reality. So why would we ever put our race consciousness to the side, right? That should be the biggest takeaway that we already operate in that. Also, when you only hire one or two people, that sets us up for more trauma. Right? Absolutely. More trauma and more drama that we have to operationalize ourselves in because we now have to speak back to that system. Like Ebony was saying, y'all got to leave me alone so I could do my work. You hired me to be able to actually do this, but instead I have to speak back to that. Now I put a couple of bullet points down here that I think that, you know, could work out to the system that be for them to pay attention to how they can create space for us to do us. First of all, we need opportunities to collaborate without criticism, right? There are multiple different ways in which we come to the system and not all of them are under one set standard, right? Each of us has a different set of ways to accomplishing the same end goal that we have, that we're aiming for. Second, we need opportunities to fail and to grow. When Absolutely. we put something out there and we test it and it doesn't work, we're learning lessons about how we can adapt and shift the system so that it does do what we need to do um, for our our students and also for us as faculty members who have to set the standard for the generation that comes after us. Also, we need opportunities to say no, right? Like Tony Jones says, my purpose is not to work all day, fam, right? I got family at home. I'm a single mom of three. I got a mama. I got a daddy. I got a community that I operate in. We need opportunities to say no so that we can give ourselves more fully when we are called upon to this opportunity. Um, for my white colleagues out there who I embrace because we do have allies, I need y'all to ask before criticizing. Before you assess my work, I need you to ask me how I came to do that work because because there are many times when you assess the things that we're doing and you have zero idea of how we came to make those conclusive actions and why we put that on the table the way that we did. Your method may not be our method. And finally, please family, be forgiving of our failures right? We already hard on ourselves. We're over self-reflective. We think very hard about the things that we put out there. We put our heart, our soul, our spirit, our energy out there. I need y'all to create space to say we forgive ourselves for when we mess up because we do mess up. We're not perfect people. We're not gods over here. That being said, we always strive to be better and to do better and to learn from the lessons that are out there. So young people, students who are listening to this like collection here, we love y'all so very much. And we also know that we reach out every single day to make sure that there is space for you so you don't have to experience the same type of trauma and drama that we go through on an everyday basis. And I'll leave it at that. That's a whole word and a half. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Barry, and, and for those on the call, we've got folks closing out, so we ask you to stay along for at least another good 10 minutes. Yes, that, that was great, Doc. Everyone, Dr. Jessica. And I just want to say, you know, I'm going to begin with stop asking for permission. Our ancestors already gave us permission. Stop asking permission to be for black excellence and black liberation. And what do I mean by that is, no, you're probably not gonna have allies at your campus. You're probably not gonna have allies at your district, but guess what? Get in spaces like this, get in spaces like this that, that validate what you're saying, that validate what you're doing, right? So quit asking for permission, do it, just do it. That's all I have to say, quit asking for permission. And when you're denied, Find another collaborator. Go another route. 
And if you find someone that you cannot trust, don't even tell them, but continue to move, continue to move because we're doing it for our students. And not only that, we're doing it for black communities. Go ahead now, Dr. Parker. Parting words. I would say, in addition to what has been spoken, I don't know, I think we could drop the mic at the last two um, individuals who spoke, but I will say um, to leave this space with creating space to have an understanding of the black, black faculty perspective, and even more importantly, create spaces to have an understanding of the needs of the students, the black students in particular, in which we are serving, and not assume that just because you do the check mark in your student equity and achievement plans that now you have met the mark and met the needs of African-American students, but give them the platform to speak out and listen and make changes and adjust to their needs. Thank you. Dr. White, thank you, Dr. Park. Um, <clears throat> really quick for me, again, every student deserves to have a black teacher, all students, benefit from having black teachers. I've been the only black professor in my division for at least the last 10 years. Only one, biggest division on campus, humanities and social sciences, just me. So I fly the black flag flag uh, uh, willingly, you know, and uh, powerfully when I get the chance to, that's what, we, that's what I'm gonna do. So again, if you're trying to get into this system, this corporate plantation model system, it's going to be tough. It's going to be taxing. It's going to be something that, you know, you 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 may uh, have some regrets about why am I here? Like Ebony just mentioned a, a little while back, man, I could be doing something else. I'm talented enough to do five, six, seven, eight different things, but we're here for the students. Black teachers, black faculty bring something unique to every campus in this 115, 116 California community colleges. I'll leave it on that. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Appreciate that. Dr. Foster. Okay, thank you. Um, so part of it, I do want to, I do want to um, piggyback on what, is what Dr. Khalid White said had to say about how important it is for all students to see Black faculty, um, and and I'm in a discipline that it's very difficult to find black faculty. Um, and part of that, well, there's a whole, there's a whole, I could, I could do a whole talk about why it's difficult to find black faculty in, in, in certain STEM fields, but that we'll say that for another time. But, um, but it is really important that people see um, that black faculty are truly um, outstanding in what they do from a collegial point of view, and that and that black faculty are not just the ones that sit on the equity committee, that black faculty are part of the are part of all of that is academia, and that and it's so one of the most important things they need to see is that students of all colors, races, and creeds need to see that from from their from their from their uh, black faculty professionals. That's why we need more black faculty, and I would say we need more black faculty even that are part time, and that if you are black faculty who are part time an adjunct or associate, whatever they call them where you are. I would also encourage you, as you've done some service there, to spread your net further when you're looking for a full-time position. Don't believe that because you served three years part-time faculty in this district, that they're going to hire you full-time. But if you're willing to spread your, cast your net a little further, you will find people who are anxious to, who are anxious to hire you. So a lot of times we limit ourselves because- Absolutely. We limit ourselves because we think I'm in this district and I've done all this work in this district and they're going to see my value. Um, I, don't do that. After you put this work in, cast your net wide. There are people who are looking for you and they're probably not in your district. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Foster, Dr. Lobby, Dr. Hastings, Dr. Berry, Dr. Parker, Dr. White, Dr. Collins, Professor Tari, and Salam. Um, I shared with my colleagues here earlier, I felt a little, I was sick this morning. I was still on for this conference call, had a big old headache. But um, to Dr. Lava's point, these are nutrient spaces. Like I feel being on this call with you not too much of that. Like my energy is higher. And so this is the type of spaces that Black faculty produce. 
we are healed. As we are wounded warriors in our institutions, we are healed. So for all the administrators on this call, know the power and the prolific ability of our people. Not just their brilliance, but their majestic capacity. I'm gonna turn over to Professor Eric Handy to close this out, but I wanna thank every single one of you. I know you're off today. I know some of y'all have some other webinars I pulled you out of, but I definitely, definitely love y'all and I appreciate y'all for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bull, for that wonderful, wonderful panel that you helped produce. Thank you to all the panelists and to all the viewers out there. We're not done yet, but before we go, we wanna make sure that you see that all week we've been given uh, sketch summaries and the cost of freedom, speaking up to diversify the faculty ranks, it's a lot, right? And so we want you to just take a moment to look at this. We will make sure that this is sent out to the networks. We are also streaming live on the YouTube channel. We also encourage you to go visit our link tree at CA Black Students on the social media sites. And again, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that we have statement tees that we want everybody to go get. So you can walk through your campus, you can go into your department meetings and unapologetically let your president, your vice president, your deans, your chairs know that you are speaking up and you are living the truth of the black hour. We have some closing remarks by three fine individuals who have in, the mo in their own right been uh, surviving the black tax. In their own right, they know the cost of freedom to get into the positions that they are. And as we close out with these closing remarks, let me give you this. You can't go hashtag Black Lives Matter, Black Student Success, the Black Hour, if you leave today and don't do something. Don't write your chair. If you don't go talk to your president, if you don't go reach out to some of the panelists, if you don't step up and start saying, hey, the buck stops with me. One easy thing you could do is go to the YouTube channel and forward each day, each webinar to your whole college community and who cares if they want it or not. Hey, next thing you could do is use these conversations, use these tools, these gems as professional development. Yeah, I'll let that sit. Today we have Mr. Ken Brown, the president-elect of the CCTT board. We have Dr. Breland, also president-elect of the CEO CC board. And we have Ms. Pamela Haynes, president of the California Community Colleges Board of Governors. This is the first time in history, the first time in history, I'll say that again, that we've had three black leaders at these positions at the same time in the system. So we are making change. The change comes slow, but if I heard Dr. Berry correctly, we're going to expedite that process and start today. Honorable Ken Brown, would you lead us off with our closing remarks? Thank you, Professor Handy. Oh, man, thank you to this esteemed, esteemed panel. Uh, I'm, I'm blessed and thankful for the invitation just to, just to, just to talk to you guys. I'm, I'm not going to make it too long. Um, we heard, oh my gosh, we heard so much good stuff. And if you, if you check that, if you check out the sketch effect, you know, they, they, they really captured it well. We are the main course. We are the main course. Without uh, black students, black faculty, black administration, black electeds, um, you know, this state wouldn't be in the, in the, in the place it is. Um, but at the same time, you know, we know that not everybody is in it for the reasons that we are on uh, on the call and on the Zoom uh, for. We have to really understand why we are in the positions that we're in. I really want to highlight, you know, we're in, we're in a time that we've never had, you know, a black president of trustees, a black uh, president of the CEO board for, for community college at the same time as, as, as we have a, a black chairwoman of the Board of Governors. You know, that's how God works sometimes. And so 21 and 22, we need to be doing something. You know, we need to keep cooking that gumbo. Um, we talked about diverse pool of candidates. We talked about how to do that. 
the first thing we need to do is we need to make sure that we volunteer and we raise our hand. Uh, if you're faculty, I'm faculty at Cal State. I'm black faculty at Cal State. I'm a black faculty at Cal State who teach physics. So I'm in STEM and engineering. We need to make sure that just like, just like our, our panel said, we need to show up for not only our students in the classroom, but we need to raise our hand. We need, to, we need to be a part of those campus tours. We need to be a part of those, that lecture series at lunch. They need to see you. The students need to see you. Our black students need to see you and our non-black students need to see you. You know what it's like being 6'6", six, six, bald and black, going into a physics class full of uh, uh, non-minority students, looking at you like you're in, the wrong, you're in the wrong room. But you know what, I embrace that. That's what I want to do. I want to, uh, 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 I, I want to, uh, you know, break down those stereotypes. Yeah, I'm a physicist. That's what it, that's what this looks like. Get used to it. When you go out there, you're gonna see me. But we need to we need to have more of that um, for those faculty members and students who are feeling left out or by themselves. I need you to find a buddy. There's a whole, there's, there's, last I counted, there's about 850 people on this, on this call. All right. I need you to find a buddy, you know, here's my name, you know, my, I, I'm gonna put my email in the chat in a minute. If you need something, you need to reach out. If you're on a campus that you don't think has enough black faculty, again, raise your hand, get on one of those faculty hiring committees. If you don't know how to do that, find a, a, a black faculty, find a black administrator, find your black uh, trustee. These are the things that we have to do. This is like Angela Bassett said in Mission Impossible, that's the job. That's what we have to do. I, so I charge each and every one of uh, you who are in earshot of my, my, my voice, understand that this right now, this moment right now is a moment that we've never been at. For people who are, who are tired, for people who've never seen uh, uh, you know, what a black physicist or a black uh, a, a president of board of trustees look like, this is the time. So we have to, you know, again, this is your call to action. I'm, I'm energized by every speaker that we've had this week. I want you guys to reach out. I'm, I'm an open book. Uh, I'm setting the table up for Dr. Breland and, and trustee Haynes who are coming on after me. This is just the appetizer, but we have work to do. Thank you. Thank you, brother, uh, and Trustee Brown, I appreciate that. And, you know, it's certainly my pleasure to really say thank you to everybody uh, for joining us this week. Uh, I wanna thank the students uh, who shared with us earlier in the week. Uh, so thank you to Janelle, Jesus, Reese, Devante. It really is all about them. Uh, and I wanna thank all the sponsors, especially the Community College of League of California for their support, uh, as well as the panelists and everyone for coming together to deliver these insightful and thought provoking webinars. Uh, the attendance has been absolutely outstanding. Uh, uh, and it's certainly been a year. Uh, we have all had to manage our personal, professional commitments in the midst of what can only be described as a year, like no other in our lifetime. Uh, I also want to thank the men. Uh, they're more than scholars and activists, uh, but brothers to me uh, and to one another. Uh, we all represent the diversity that exists among African-American men, all sharing the same blood, uh, taking different paths, but along the same journey. Uh, and I want to thank Dr. Bull and Dr. Handy for their unwavering energy and intellect, uh, always and especially when we need that energy the most. Thank you, two brothers. Um, and while we're proud of the impact that Black Student Success Week has had uh, with such engagement and fantastic participation, I know that some of you even had to tune in from the YouTube overflow uh, because of the demand uh, to join. Uh, but to truly turn the page on our Black Student Success crisis we need bold action that is truly unapologetic. Uh, we know that our student success crisis stems from a history of disenfranchisement, discrimination, and segregation that is certainly alive and well today. But from the arrival of the first enslaved Africans during the colonial history of the United States to present day, African Americans are the only ethnic group in the United States that have fought in every war, fought by or within the U.S., including the Revolutionary War, War 1812, Civil War, World War I and II, et cetera, just to name a few. However, and interestingly enough, we have not reached or attained that evasive freedom we have fought for. 
And we all know that one of the most prudent gateways to intellectual, financial, and emotional freedom extends through educational access, opportunity, and achievement. Like many of you, I contend that we can't have Black Student Success Week just one week out of the year. It can't become like Black History Month, which coincidentally also started out as a week where we raise our awareness at one period of time in the year and for the rest of the year go back to status quo. And we can't continue to let the emotional and physical toll continue to burden a select group of people. We talked about the black tax earlier. Uh, people, of people of color continue to do this work. We need everyone to step into the circle, join hands every day to assist our students as well as one another. And like we say, black history, is American history. We also need to believe and have the conviction that Black student success is student success. There were many resolutions, in fact, that were written over the past 13 months. Lots of wordsmithing, debates over language, semantics. Do we use Black, African American, African descent, BIPOC? Uh, now, don't get me wrong, it was refreshing to have such acknowledgement of deeply embedded social issues that have occurred all of my life, uh, but these issues conveniently never got the airtime they deserved. Now we have major educational institutions, business, <laughs> industries, companies alike that had not made such acknowledge, acknowledgments in the past, now doing so. However, I fear that many of the action items, if there were actually any action items in these resolutions or statements, uh, they're tough to implement and that the momentum will be lost or in some cases not even initiated. The question that I have for everyone is this, uh, if we could rebuild everything from scratch, would we rebuild it the same way? Of course, that's a rhetorical question but what would we do differently? How would we educate our students? How would we support them? How would we create a system that worked to facilitate black student success? Who would we hire? And what skill sets would we value in those hires? What would we teach our students? How would we set up the environment for teaching and learning with this new perspective in mind? Students of color have been systematically denied access, not only to higher education, but also access to the workforce, housing, healthcare, and literally anything and everything that anyone would need to participate in the society in a meaningful and healthy way. So my challenge to you is this, look at this as an opportunity to rebuild. Rebuild something that works because what we are doing is not working. Get the egos out of the way. Stop with the lack of funding assertions. Stop with the union won't let us do an excuse. Uh, we truly need a fresh perspective or a psychological framework that allows us to construct a rebuild without looking at the student, the black student as being so challenged or hard to reach or that getting him or her to be successful simply takes too much or takes more than we have to give. Our students were never taught, and in some cases can't believe that their ancestors invented math and science, astronomy, that they were masters of the arts and literature and storytelling. And we're amongst the most peaceful and collaborative people on the planet. I, I in fact, remember one Sunday afternoon being on the phone with doctors uh, Bull and Bush uh, and how we, and talking about how we needed to change the psychological frameworks of how we as practitioners view our field or our trade as educators, if you would. For instance, we talk about we talk about building our math and science buildings in the likeness of great pyramids or temples of Egypt or the Mayan empires. Wouldn't that be a great way to start the conversation about our illustrious history with not only our students but also our staff and faculty about how to do things a bit differently, and of course, with the relevant creative curriculum and pedagogies to follow. Why not empower our students in this way with such a reminder of who they are? Might that impact student success a little bit? I think so. And I'll close by saying this, uh, as a system, we can't fully realize our vision for student success without uplifting all of our students, utilizing the resources that we have at our disposal, with the most valuable resource being our perspective and the lens with which we choose to view our students in the communities that we serve. To truly turn the page on Black student success, on the Black student success crisis, and to address that sense of urgency called out by our system board of governors president, Sister Pamela Haynes, who's going to speak next, we will need bold federal, state, and regional district level policy solutions, as well as redoubled local efforts to keep advancing student success. I believe that with leadership, cooperation, and with the focus on the task at hand, change is imminent. California's community colleges are taking some valiant steps to address the issue. And I want to thank you all again for your efforts, leadership, partnership, and ongoing attention to this crisis. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to our Board of Governors President, uh, Sister Pamela Haynes. Thank you so very much. Um, I'm supposed to close this out. And so I want this message to be to our students, to and for our, our Black students in particular. Um, 
I want you to know that you have voice and I want you to use it. You are more than just students. And in many cases, you are, are essential workers, you are caregivers, you are parents. Um, some of you come out of the foster care system. Some of you are part of the LGBT community. Some of you live at home. Some of you are, are, are living on your own and some of you are couch surfing and are looking for housing. Many of you are first generation college going students. And so it's really, really important for you to understand that you are still on your educational journey. And I, among everyone who's spoken here today, know how sometimes that is difficult. And time can be a killer of dreams. And so it is critically important that we recognize those who have power to make decisions on our behalf need to hear from us. And more importantly, they need to hear from you as students. They need to hear your stories. They need to hear your experiences. There, it's not, a, it's not a, a mistake that we are holding this student's Black Student Success Week here and now at the end of April and the beginning of May. Because in Sacramento, where they make policy, where they make funding decisions, where they make a determination of who gets what, that's where this happens. And so we have been talking about the needs of Black students, the needs of faculty, the needs of our institutions. And this is where, and this is the time where those decisions get made. And we don't have to be apologetic about that. We must be re relentless about what it is we need and that our community colleges need to be at the front of the line and that our black students have a right to be at the front of the front of the line relative to funding. And so I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be sympathetic. I'm not gonna be apologetic because that's, the data represents that. And so it is, okay, somebody said at, in the, at the panel discussion and I wrote it down, no more whispering. This is not a time to whisper. This is a time to be disruptive and to be, be disruptive of the system. And sometimes we have to make, um, take uncomfortable actions in order to do that. So in closing, I want you to know that I'm all in and I'm unapologetic about that. And I see you, our black students, as the generation that will lead. And so you are our freedom fighters. You are our equity fighters. And you are, um, you are here because this is where education, opportunity, equity, and funding come together. So in, um, in, in the John Lewis tradition, I want you to go out there and I want you to make good trouble. So with that, I wanna thank you so much for participating in this week and hope you have a wonderful weekend.